p.m. on Thursday evening. On Sunday, uh, February 10th, the Brookline PAX will hold its annual meeting in the MLK room at Brookline High School, 7 p.m., with guest speaker, retired Judge Nancy Gertner. On Monday, February 11th, at 6.30 p.m. in the school committee room on the fifth floor, town hall, the B-Space committee will be meeting to hear more about school space needs, budget impacts, and educational programs that are being considered. Also on Monday, February 11th, at 7 p.m. in the Devotion Cafeteria, there will be a neighborhood meeting with Chief O'Leary, and I believe Selectman Daly will be present. Um, to discuss the series of attacks in North Brookline and the ongoing effort to arrest the culprits and to and what preventive measures are being taken. And finally, also on Monday, February the 11th, it's going to be a busy night, uh, in room 103 down on the first floor in Town Hall at 7.30, there will be a legislative roundtable uh, with State Senator Cream and our representatives who will give updates on current legislation and the fiscal 14 budget. Any other comments, additions? For Selectman Daly? I just want to say uh, to Selectman Goldstein and all the other Rotarians how very much I enjoyed the chocolate extravaganza. It was a wonderful event, and I, I hope you raised a lot of money, but um, I... It, so, somebody, the Otto's Pizza was there, and it, finally, after eating a lot of chocolate, <laughs> I said, I have to go eat some real food, so I got my slice of pizza to keep it going, was it was a, very nice. Uh, it was a lot of chocolatey fun, I'll, I'll yeah. say that. I wish I had a number to report, but uh, I won't know that until Thursday. Well, days. we think it was pretty well attended, I will say that. It was Great. full of people. And, and I must say, I'd never been in that Pine Manor room mm, before. Yeah, it's gorgeous. What a beautiful location. Beautiful. It and, is. Uh, what a treasure. Yeah. Uh, to, to have that room available. And it seemed like a lot of uh, people, you know, sometimes it's, I recognize the same faces at a lot of these things, but this seemed to get a different crowd, and I wondered if some of the Pine the Manor students had, had um, no, no, joined, think, joined the I event. I think we had a lot of Pine Manor students. Ah, I see. Okay. Selectman Benka. Yes, uh, Selectman Daly, in the eyes of some, chocolate <laughs> is real food. <laughs> Especially dark well, chocolate. Well, we now know dark chocolate is good for you. That's yeah. that's good news. There right. was, I think I maybe ate a little more than was good for me. <laughs> then, but <laughs> um, there, just following up on chocolate, there was a wonderful article about serenade chocolate oh, in yes, this morning's in Globe. Globe. Yes, thank you um, for mentioning it. And uh, just about the craftsmanship of the chocolate and uh, the um, work of um, uh, the owner of serenade chocolate with right. uh, immigrants to to this area, so right. it was just a terrific article. And fabulous chocolates, too. Absolutely. Um, and on Saturday, um, there was a, um, a get-together of the for the New Year's of the Brookline Asian American Family Network, oh. and uh, I, I went to that and uh, saw my first live Gangnam Style dancing uh -huh. with the, the kids, <laughs> and uh, this is high-energy stuff and a lot of fun. So. Uh, that was uh, that was well attended, and I think uh, I think uh, people were very pleased at the first annual. Well, that's great. Year of the Snake is a part. Yeah, it is the right. Year of the Snake. Yeah, yes. Right, right. Okay. Shall we now move to our real business? Uh, first item is the um, approving the minutes from uh, January 29th. Are there corrections or additions? I do have some small edits, yes. Okay, then I move that we approve the minutes as amended. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman, whoops, Selectman Daly. Aye. <laughs> Going around that's, the table. That's Sorry fine. about that. That's fine. Okay, and Mr. Gwigley repairs <coughs> to the Unified Excuse Arts me. Building. Uh, yes, good evening. The uh, question before you is... Uh, uh, approval and execution of a contract in the amount of $91,950 to uh, the firm of CSS Architects Incorporated of Wakefield. And this is for the design of um, uh, exterior building envelope uh, improvements, to, uh, I won't say improvements, uh, repairs uh, to the Unified Arts Building. I have a question. Uh, at the top, under the scope, it says replace all the slate roof shingles, and then down under schematic design, it seems to waffle over whether we're replacing the slate roof shingles. 
where it says preliminary details of options to fix and alternative roofing systems. Can you that explain, was, please? That was my question, too. Sorry. I thought, the, I thought the whole point of slate roof yes, shingles they last was they kind of last forever. So well, answer our building, question, please. The building was built in 1901. Yep. And as far as we know, it's the original roof. And uh, we had a study done some time ago that indicated that the roof itself is in poor condition. And uh, some of the things they noted was that the... Uh, uh, the tar paper under the slate has disintegrated in most areas, and they used steel nails years ago instead of what is currently used copper slate nails. And the nails are rusting and allowing the roof slates to become unfastened. And uh, overall, it says the roof is in poor condition. So uh, the roof needs to be replaced. And uh, uh, that's why we're at this point. Okay, Selectman Daly? Yeah, but wouldn't you take the slate shingles off, fix the undercoating, and then put the slate shingles back on? Uh, I am not uh, predisposed, I would say, in my personal opinion, to any particular fix. I think it's our duty to look at various options and see which is the best uh, 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 approach considering all such items as material, cost, life cycle, and uh, cost benefit analysis. So, all that being said, uh, we will be, uh, you note in here, we're going to be meeting with uh, preservation and uh, the building commission and others. Uh, all of that will factor in here. Well, I, I would certainly say, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to vote. Uh, this, but I would certainly um, like them to look at, at the alternatives, as Selectman DeWitt mentioned, and, and not necessarily jump to the uh, replacing those slate. Oh, I mean, uh, I, yeah, yeah, it, it may part of the solution may be in reusing some or all of the slate, right? Right. But you know, we're also going to look at potential non-slate options. And can you? Well, I don't think you're in a position to answer this question, but I guess you've already partly introduced it. Namely, you've got a roof that's been there for 100 years plus. And I would say the standard for a replacement is equal quality, even though it may be that after 100 years this one is a little tired. If you can't do something of equal standard quality, then I think we really would be concerned. Okay? I get it. All right. Quick question. Sure, Slayton uh, Tony, I know I know a few high school students, and uh, I get I hear from them from time to time that that building is exceptionally cold in the winter time. I don't know if the windows have been replaced any time recently, or is it possible that any part of this scope of work might address uh, the draftiness and uh, general difficulty in keeping a good room temperature there? No, I don't think so because um, this is strictly roof and masonry work. Uh, in the budget, potentially if we're considering replacing or redoing the slate roof in kind, uh, that's extremely costly. And uh, uh, so it's going to be a challenge uh, to make this project work for the building needs within the budget as it is. And uh, it's not necessarily going to, it will not address uh, any of those issues. Do you know how old the windows are there? Uh, not off the top of my head. The building was renovated, though, in the last 10 years, that's right? That's right. Well, I there was some work done wrong? during the high school. I don't remember yeah. whether we replaced the windows or mm. not. I mm -hmm. mean, but the the work on the, the gym building and the tapping was very minimal as mm. opposed to the rest of the campus at the time. Right. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Quigley? Uh, then I move that we approve and execute a contract in the amount of $91,950 for designer services for building envelope repairs at the Unified Arts Building. 
All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, next is Mr. Ditto. An inventory of signs. Good evening. Public Works is requesting that the Board of Selectmen award and execute contract with World Tech Engineering to perform a town-wide uh, inventory of traffic signs and street signs. The study will locate an inventory of approximately 10,000 street signs within the public ways. Some of the 26 attributes that we will be collecting as part of this study include, but are not limited to, there will be a unique sign ID number, there will be a sign legend, a sign color, sign size, shape, sign height, and probably most importantly is the retro reflectivity of the sign. Segment daily. Yeah, is this some, I, I noticed at some point in your letter to us, I think it says, or I guess this is Mr. Papasturgeon's letter to us, it talks about traffic signs. So the street signs that, that you know, those signs identifying streets that many people are concerned about the historic They're signs, the list. Is, are they included in this or not? They are. Okay. Yep. So, um, Upon completion of this, we will be downloading this data to our GIS system as well as a cartograph workflow management system. And this will be a tremendous uh, plus for the DPW in that our uh, work order system is the cartograph system. This will make it very easy to track what work's been completed and uh, what the costs were. And you might asked why are we doing this at this time and the reason being is that the Federal Highway Administration is requiring cities and towns to establish and implement a sign assessment or management plan that will retain the minimum retro reflectivity as outlined in the uh, manual and uniform traffic control devices. So this is a regulation that was precipitated by the FHA and it's codified in the uh, MUTCD manual. Now, in part, it states in that manual that, and it's very similar to what was previously said, is that public agency or efficient officials having jurisdiction shall use an assessment or management method that is designed to maintain sign retro reflectivity at or above the minimum levels in Table 28-3. Now, as part of that manual, they said there'd be a completion date, date by 2015. And the FHA got a lot of feedback on that. And since that date was established, they modified <clears throat> their regulation to allow communities to replace traffic signs when they are worn out rather than replacing signs on a specific timetable. So that's a big plus for us. I, I would like to ask, um, it seems to me that one of the things that could happen here, and it could be inadvertent, but it would not be desirable, and I'm kind of following up on Selectman Daly's question, that we somehow n identify our historic street signs as non-compliant. And well, frankly, that would not <laughs> comply with the town's desires and intent. Right. They did respond partially to that in that they, um, they um, if you just wait one second. And it, 
in the latest um, final ruling, they said the FHA will allow communities to retain historic street name signs in historic districts. Now, I know that doesn't cover the whole town, but at least a portion of the signs will be uh, exempt from this ruling. Uh, but but just to be clear, I believe what I'm hearing is historic signs as they fail, fall, break, whatever, that are not in a designated local historic district are not going to be replaced properly with similar signs. Um, it's, this isn't to say you can't have those signs. In okay, place. well, I'm very concerned that we lock ourselves into some sort of database that has a red flag that says now you have to put up a new sign. Um, Uh, that question I can't I can't answer at this point in time. That, you know, that that's an issue actually that that we've been going around and around on uh, in the town. And and my understanding was that um, uh, the old signs could be retained. And indeed, we were even looking at um, redoing the signs, uh, having having uh, the old signs replicated. Um, because they had been mistakenly taken down. Right. And um, Well, I, I, I do remember when we had some meetings on this a number of years ago, uh, and I believe you telling me, Ms. Mr. Ditto, or telling uh, those of us at the meeting, that, that our, our historic signs did not have the retro reflectivity that they were um, supposed to have under these that's, rules. That's true. And I, I, so I, I, too, am very concerned about creating this database that identifies a bunch of our signs as, as um, not passing the standards when, when we very much want to retain those signs. And I, I don't know whether we should just leave the street signs off this inventory or if we could identify those signs that are the original signs as historic we put that designation on them, mm -hmm. even if they're not in a historic district. But any 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 sign that was that original sign with the raised letters made, I, you know better than I do what the mm -hmm. description is. But have those identified as on this description as each one of them that's like that as historic. That's so, so that if anyone looks at that database. It, it, part of the issue here is that we've got some existing historic districts. We may have new ones in places where those historic signs exist, mm -hmm. and we want to save them. Right. What's the penalty if we don't do this? I, I don't know. Probably okay. isn't any. I may, I may not be prepared to vote this. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be happy I, to hold this. I, I want to hold it. I, I okay. think we need to have more information. I'm not comfortable. It sounds to me as though there is a high risk that we would create something that would almost target these historic signs for replacement. And I do not think that is something that we would choose to do. So we need some more information, if you don't mind. OK. Could, I'll yeah, could, could you uh, send the actual um, regulation around the federal highway regulation? Or uh, there's also a reference in Andy's letter to uh, the state statute um, Chapter 90, Section 18. That I can get, but yeah. I'm just, you know, whatever is the supposed mandate of this, is it possible for you to send that around to members of the board? Absolutely. Okay, great. And I wonder, uh, Mr. Kleckner, if we could check with the, if you could check with the historic preservation people here, Jean and Amarada and, and uh, Greer Hardwick. Greer Hardwick, and see if there's any, th any way we can get some kind of designation for our historic signs that without that. making I, I, I thought, thought, thought we'd gone through that. Senator I thought Kerry's we'd done office, that. I yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah right. I thought we had a federal waiver through well, Senator Kerry's office. I'm not office. sure we ever received the waiver, but... Um, well, we, we certainly we, were told about it. I thought we, we were commenting on their proposed regulations, and it sounds to me like they've uh, accommodated to some extent the town's concerns or relevant concerns in a in the regulations, but we'll find out more. Yeah, and okay. uh, I think there are some other communities with historic signs that are similar to ours who, who have sort of formed a little, you know, group. <laughs> so we ought to find out about that, too. So okay. we'll hold this one. Thank sure. you, Mr. Ditto. Yep. <clears throat> um, next.
Next, we have a couple of temporary beverage licenses. Any questions about these? No. And I move that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverage license to the Brookline Library Foundation in connection with an Oscar celebration on February 12th at the Coolidge Corner Branch Library. And that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverage license to the BU Bach Funk student group uh, for reception to be held on February 16th at 808 Commonwealth Avenue. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, next item is uh, Puppet Showplace. Do we have someone here to speak? Would you mind coming just up to the podium? I think we've asked you to come because this seems to be a different uh, pattern of performance compared to previously. And we're actually not accustomed to seeing a list like this requesting temporary licenses. So we'd like to hear what you're doing. Uh, sure, certainly I can speak to that. Uh, my name is Bradley Duguid. I'm the operations manager at the Puppet Show Place mm -hmm. Theater. Uh, and we have been uh, there in addition to the many, many children's shows uh, you may be familiar with during the day, uh, been doing shows for adults as well for the past several years. Uh, usually we'll have one every month or so. Um, this year we'll having usually two each month between our Puppet Slam series, which uh, we have a showing there once every other month, uh, and the Story Slam series with Mass Mouth, with which we're presenting every month. Uh, now through the beginning of the summertime. Um, we've had this uh, show series for a number of years, uh, but only recently have we identified uh, liquor uh, sales there as a potential revenue stream for us uh, by offering those in exchange for donations to the theater. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, uh, which has been in the community for uh, over 38 years now. Uh, and donations are obviously a very big part of what keeps us alive. Uh, and we found that uh, people coming to these uh, slams have been very responsive and uh, happy to give an exchange for uh, this amenity while they are at the theater. So we're uh, requesting uh, these licenses. We've thought to put them all in at uh, the same time for now through the beginning of the summertime. Questions? I, I would say my, I, you know, at some at some times in the past, the, the puppet show places had some um, Maybe disagreements is too strong, but there's been some neighbors that have been very uh, right above, and they're very concerned about noise. Now I haven't heard anything lately, so did you did you do some soundproofing? I'm just wondering if you're having more events at night, and with you know alcohol, which you know sometimes people raise their voices a little more and in a party kind of atmosphere, um, if that might not um, create some tension with the neighbors. Uh, I understand, and I think I remember one of the incidents you're referring to, I think maybe three or four years ago, mm -hmm. uh, that was solved some time ago through soundproofing uh, of the theater and the ceilings in both the theater and the lobby. Uh, and we haven't received any kind of uh, complaints since then. So, um, we have been, uh, as I said, having these adult shows, uh, usually one each month for a number of years. This is a slight increase in the number of shows for adults in the evening, um, but not by much, and uh, we haven't seen uh, much of an impact in terms of the audience behavior with the addition of the alcohol. Uh, and we very rarely have anyone uh, past 11 o'clock at night, certainly not past 11.30. My inclination would be to approve the first three and make sure we're, we don't have any kind of issue and then they can come back sure. uh, later for the last two. Uh, and I, I would like to be sure that you have talked to our I know you've had our um, police officer who reviews these applications uh, check to make sure. I know that you are safe service, uh, that you have safe service certified people. Normally when we approve things like this, we're doing it to a not-for-profit for a third party event, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So that's part of why we asked you to come because this is a little untypical for us. And there are some restrictions about your ability to sell alcohol. 
and I would like to be absolutely certain that you're not in violation. So I will uh, probably agree to vote for, what are you pre proposing? I'm saying the first, the first three. First three. But then I also want to check with uh, our town council and make sure that what you're doing is actually okay. Uh, certainly. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so we, she may want to talk to you about it. Isn't there a question about how many temporary licenses? Well, they're allowed they so many per year, and I think this is not even close to the number. I think it's about 30, so that's not the issue. But typically what we see would be what I'm going to call a venue, you guys, uh, and somebody wants to hold a fundraiser there or some other thing like that, not something that is being held by the organization for its own benefit. And that's the point that I really want to make sure is okay. I see. For your benefit and for ours, frankly. But, Certainly, right. thank you. So and and if, it helps to, if it helps to uh, frame it that, Mr. Chairman, it, um, we are a very small organization, which uh, for a long time has been responsible for our own uh, fundraising. Uh, sure, we uh, do understand. Mm -hmm. All right, it, it's just that we don't want you to be in a position where you're doing something that you might not be allowed to do. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you very much. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll ask town council to follow up and probably talk to you about exactly what's allowed. Anyway, um, so let's uh, move to approve temporary wine <clears throat> and malt be beverage license to the Puppet Showplace Theater in connection with events to take place on February 14th, March 19th, and Mar sorry, March, March 9th. 9th and March 14th. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving along, we have several candidates for boards and commissions. Uh, first on the calendar is Commission for the Disabled, Ms. Johansson. Just come forward, please. How are you? Hi. There. Hi. Um, we're interested to hear, just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the Commission for the Disabled. Well, um, <clears throat> I am a lifelong resident of Brookline, um, and my family consists of um, my mom, my son, and I. And my son has um, what we expect to be a lifelong disability. Um, I am the relative of another family member with um, a lifelong disability. I am intimately acquainted with um, supporting people whose disabilities or impairments might not be visible. And I'm interested in learning more about how to support people whose disabilities might be more visible. Um, I am hoping to go into health policy and management um, as I go forward in my career and hope to do disability policy on a bigger level. So I'd like to start to get my feet wet in my own community. Okay. Questions from members of the board? Yeah, I, I <laughs> Selectman Bank is our liaison to the commission. No, so. <laughs> I, and I would just note that Mr. Johansson has attended a couple of meetings and mm -hmm. uh, actually contributed um, huh? to those okay. meetings. So um, I have only good things to say about her. Okay. And she's also a new resident of Olmstead. Yeah, Olmstead. right. Yeah, which you heard me speak there. Yes. Yeah. She right. spoke there and uh, yeah. it's when you and I spoke there too. But, yeah. Okay, Selectman so, Daly. Yeah, I, I know that, I believe that the commission, we're, we're supposed to appoint mostly people who have disabilities, but there is one, one or two slots I know for people who have family members with disabilities. So, and there's certainly a lot of vacancies now. So we do have vacancies. It sounds right. like Ms. Johansson is a good candidate. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interest, and you'll hear from us in writing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank a good you. evening. Um, the next. Uh, what's the next on the list? Preservation Commission, Ms. Saidian. Welcome. Thank you. So same question. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the Preservation Commission. Um, I've been a Brookline resident for the last 23 years. Um, I have um, appreciation of culture, art, and humanity in general. Currently, I'm a commissioner for the art in Brookline. 
and um, I, I see it as a next step to my uh, field of interest. Uh, I have a background in design as well as I'm a real estate uh, broker, and um, I see it very much into my um, field to, um, to learn more as well as uh, contribute to the uh, community. Okay. Um, do you, have you ever gone to a Preservation Commission meeting? Not to the meetings, but I have been to different uh, sittings with, uh, with the commissioners, with the, um, with the rare and uh, um, to, to find about different properties and also. So you talk to the staff probably? I talk to the staff. Right, to the, right. To the meetings, okay. Not yet. You, you haven't gone to an actual commission meeting. That's, no, that's, that was my question. I applied yeah. for it. Uh, okay. They send me no, it's not a requirement. It was just yeah. curiosity. Other uh, questions for Ms. Saidia? Yes, Slightman Daly. Yeah, I know there's a, there's always some tension um, when people are trying to renovate their home if they live in a in a historic district. And um, do do you have any thoughts on you know what how to strike the balance between people being able to do something that that you know they can do and that's not reasonably affordable and so forth, but still historic? Well, I, can t I live in a historic home. I live on Tappan Street, and um, I, pres I renovate the entire building, and I preserved as much as I could. Um, I ran over the truck to get my doorknobs back. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, um, I'm very much interested to preserve as much uh, mm -hmm. building as I can. Okay. okay, any other questions? Then, thank you very much for your interest, and um, I should have said before also, we're trying to do appointments maybe next week. I'm not sure how soon we'll get to this, but you'll be notified in writing uh, when the appointments are made. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for your interest. Thank you. And now, information technology, Mr. Gallagher. Good evening. Welcome. Good to see you again, Betsy. Nice to see you also. And I'm not even going to repeat the question. You just get to sure. speak. <laughs> uh, I've been a, a Brookline resident for more years than I care to remember, but um, my family has deep roots in Brookline. I've been a volunteer at a number of organizations, had the pleasure of working closely with Betsy when she was executive director of the Community Foundation. I was on the board for six years and treasurer for three. My wife has also volunteered for a number of organizations uh, over the years, and I sold my software company last year, and I found myself with a little bit of free time in my hands, and I have significant and deep IT experience. I've been a technologist for 40 years, I have multiple degrees in business, and I happened to be speaking with the CIO, and we were talking about the utilization of uh, speech recognition and text-to-speech mm. and messaging and mm. all of the things mm. to help um, town residents, uh, especially those with disabilities, um, reach into the town information center without having to get a hold of a lot of people at 8 o'clock at night or on the weekends. That happens to be an area where I do have significant expertise. And he said, I really like you to apply for this position. <laughs> so uh, he pushed me here. No, not, not really, but he, uh, he said, I'd really like you to be on my team if it's at all possible. So I said, well, this, this is, seems to be right up my alley. So uh, here I am. Well, certainly sounds like it. And um, you, you are definitely, um, I think, would be joining a, uh, a group where you will be comfortable. <laughs> Also, I, I did uh, compliment him on, yeah. uh, based on my experience with other towns, the town of Brookline's website and the information is in the top rank. Oh, nice to hear that. And really cutting edge compared to a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of other towns. And my goal is to help keep it there. Well, we, we are very, um, as you may be aware, uh, interested in improving our interactive technology. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the, um, the IT department has been helping uh, with applications and um, trying to make it easier for citizens to communicate. Uh, we have our Brook Online system that we hope people are using more and more, and so um, it seems well-timed. Questions for Mr. Gallagher? Okay, thank you. No, I, I, Sackman I, Baker. No, I, 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 know, I, I know John also through uh, uh, the uh, 
Brookline Community Foundation and uh, your work there. And, uh, and the old Sewell playground where our kids went to uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, preschool together. Exactly, exactly. So, um, And uh, just looking at the resume, um, uh, you've certainly been in the area yeah. and uh, working on IT. So I think it's terrific. Well, I I'm delighted that you uh, have the free time. So we so can benefit I. from it. <laughs> so is my wife. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. All right. Uh, you, I'm sure, aware then, because I, I'm sure Kevin told you that there is a vacancy. Uh, we have no other applicants at this point in time, and we'll probably be making our appointments in the next week or so, and you'll be notified great. in writing. Great. But in the meantime, you're free to go to their meetings. Okay. Thank okay. you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you for your interest. Okay, now we're going to have a little uh, update from the town administrator on his uh, recruitment plans for a new planning and community development director. Sure, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you know, it's been several months uh, in, uh, since our former planning director, Jeff Levine, has left. As you recall, he went to become the planning director in uh, the city of Portland, Maine. I've had a chance to say hello to Jeff a couple times and through his boss who I am um, a colleague with I check in and he's doing very well so for all you we, we, he and I had a conversation in which he said you know the population of Portland Maine and the population of Brookline is very very similar wow really uh, oh yeah because Portland really looks like well it feels a like a city doesn't it yeah. but it's a regional center but it was very it was interesting to me to hear I think Portland may be 60,000 but it's it's not that different it's mm -hmm. not as big as you think it is yeah. but it, as, as you said it is a regional center, largest city in the, in the state, I believe. But in any event, um, you know, we have been uh, working very deliberately uh, on this, and there was a method to that madness. Um, you know, we, we've had uh, some study of our planning department in the past, uh, not that long ago, and uh, we wanted to have an opportunity to let that um, sit for a while and also to, uh, to give um, uh, an interim uh, management team an opportunity to uh, work with the department and and uh, and work through a few issues and I, and I think it's been very positive uh, uh, Kara Bruton who's our acting director along with Polly Selko and Joe Viola have really tried hard to um, to take into consideration some of the findings in the study that talked about uh, silos in the department and the inability for some di some divisions within the department to talk to one another and to collaborate and I think they've done a really good job in uh, trying to address that issue. Uh, I'm not sure quite honestly how big of an issue it was, but it's been talked about and the department and the staff have been uh, working on it. And I, I've seen some improvements and I've been very <coughs> pleased with that. Um, I uh, also was uh, quite honestly, frankly, looking to see if Kara uh, would be interested uh, in the position uh, as a candidate. She, she is not. And uh, uh, I've asked a lot of different ways and a lot of different times, but um, the, the answer continues to be no. So we will, uh, at this point, I think we're ready to go out into the market and to look for, uh, recruit for a uh, full-time and permanent planning and community development director in essentially the same job description that was, was uh, vacated by uh, Mr. Levine. So my goal is to um, begin the recruitment process uh, and appoint a search group uh, as soon as possible because I want them to be more involved in the recruitment up front uh, than normally would be the case. And so I uh, respectfully request the board's authorization to commence that process and to um, designate one of your own to the search group. I have, uh, as you know, pointed out that uh, I had asked Ken Goldstein, who was uh, formerly a member of the planning board, to serve on that group, and he has graciously ag agreed to do so. So, questions? Like Mandaly. Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably a good idea to, to um, get going on this, and I'm sure Selectman Goldstein will do a good job. But I, I have to ask now that it's been pointed out to me that Portland and Brookline have a similar po population. They have a jet port there, Mal. And a, they also have cruise are, ships. Yeah, when are we going to get a jet port? I, I would rather have cruise ships myself, yeah. but. <laughs> well, um, I. I um, I'm just going to comment that I'm um, glad that we had the opportunity to sort of test out some of the information that the consultants uh, provided before going ahead. But I, I certainly my observation is that there's um, a very, that the department now is in a good place. It's being productive. And 
What I do know is that Kara, having said she does not wish to be a candidate, would like to get her old job back. So I think that's what, what her goal is. Dick. Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, Mr. Kleckner is not the only person who has asked Kara <laughs> in many ways whether she might be willing to apply for the uh, permanent job. And uh, uh, I think she's done a terrific job as interim planning director. and. Uh, uh, I'm sure will do a terrific job when she returns to her own position. As she told me, uh, she um, really uh, enjoys the work in her other job and uh, uh, does not enjoy the administrative work. So um, I think uh, she's a terrific asset to the town and, and uh, uh, it's, um, it's terrific that she's been able to do this for this period. Mel, uh, I wonder if you might just uh, speak to the need for, for, for making this replacement. I think somebody hearing this might, <laughs> might say, uh, you seem to be working fine with one less, uh, one less chief in that department. And, uh, and I, I know it to be otherwise. And I wonder if you could just, for, for, you know, for the record, make sure that it's clear that we need another staff member. Sure. Well, uh, we don't have anyone willing to step up into this role. So we do ha need to recruit. Uh, someone into the department head position. And um, I, clearly, uh, you need, for a department of that size and the scope of work they do, you need somebody who's in charge, who reports directly to me and the board, and uh, is responsible for setting the goals and the overall administrative um, direction of the department. So clearly, we need a, we need a director uh, for the department. And, uh, you know, once we fill that position, um, you know, we'll be at full strength as well in terms of, of budgeting, and uh, that's a very busy department. Um, I think last year we, we did increase uh, a, a part-time preservation staff person by a bit because of the, the involvement by the um, historic districts, the demolition bylaw, the new NCD commission, and so uh, I definitely think this is one of our busier departments and, and requires uh, full staffing at this point. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've pointed out to people, but I, I think over the last 10 years, many, many of our warrant articles have added to the responsibilities right. of the planning department in, in one way or another. And, and people sometimes don't uh, consider that, you know, as, they're, uh, as, we, as we pass more and more of these warrant articles with requirements and, and, and need for some staff um, time to see that they're implemented. Other people don't see the weekly agenda for the, right. the planning board and right. the ZBA right. that we do and know how many cases uh, they're responsible for. Yeah, I, I would say the Collins Center <clears throat> study did document uh, some of those uh, uh, demands. And uh, so for anybody who wanted to uh, see for themselves uh, some of the justification for the staffing that currently exists in the department, I think the Collins Center actually did a good job in documenting those, those kind of uh, demands on the department. And, and I would say, um, it seems, you're right, uh, Selectman Goldstein, to ask the question, because it seems, oh, the planning department, what do they do? But in fact, there are uh, a wide variety of administrative and regulatory responsibilities, including um, our affordable housing um, programs that people don't necessarily think of as part of the planning department. So you're, you're absolutely right to make that comment. And since we did just appoint the final version of the um, Neighborhood Conservation District Commission, that's a new responsibility for the preservation staff that they didn't have before. So there's a workload, a sufficient workload, I would say. Okay, so do you want us to take a vote to authorize you to fill this vacancy? I would. Okay, then I move that we authorize the town administrator to fill a vacancy in the position of Planning and Community Development Director. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Now just keep us posted on your progress. Uh, next item, town elections. Mr. Ward, come and tell us all of the changes. It will be better in the end, I think, right? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, better. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, uh, Mr. Town Administrator, I respectfully appear before you this evening to request uh, that the board reconsider and rescind their vote of January 15, 2013, 
which set the date for the annual town, town election as Tuesday, May 7, 2013. As you're aware, the Board of Selectmen has the authority to alter that date uh, under General Bylaw Article 2.1.7. On Friday, February 1, 2013, we officially received a copy of the Governor's Precepts directing towns to call the special state election to fill the vacancy in the office of the United States Senator for Tuesday, June 25, 2013. On that same day, we also received an election calendar for that special state election issued by the Secretary of the Commonwealth, which calls for the special state primary to be held on Tuesday, April 30th, 2013, exactly one week prior to the currently scheduled annual town election of May 7th, 2013. After very careful consideration, <laughs> I am recommending that the board change the date of the annual town election to April 30th, 2013, so that both the special state primary and the annual town election will be held on the same day. While holding two elections on the same day has its own set of unique administrative challenges, conducting two elections within seven days of each other presents many more. Having both elections on the same day will also allow voters greater access to both ballots and generate a cost saving somewhere in the vicinity of $45,000 to the town of Brookline. For those three reasons, I urge the board to change the date of the annual town election for the town of Brookline to Tuesday, April 30th, 2013. Okay, do we have any questions for Mr. Ward? Yes, Selectman Daly. It's, it's not really a question, but I, I, you know, we have historically had some issues getting um, a turnout at our town elections, which, as I keep explaining to people, it actually is their most important election <laughs> because that's their local taxes, et cetera, right. and how they're spent and who their representatives are in town here. But anyway, I think this will actually, it certainly would be crazy to have two elections a week apart, and I think that our turnout would suffer even more than usual in the town election had we just, you know, asked people to come and vote the week before, and um, we, would, we would be the afterthought, I suspect. Um, so I, I think both, both uh, elections will benefit by being on the same day, and I assume we'll save some money by doing it that way? Mm -hmm. What's the cost of for your well, the general cost of an election is seventy thousand um, uh, dollars. The special state elections, uh, the, the, this election scheme that was devised by the legislature in what two thousand nine, two thousand ten, uh, was deemed by Division of Local Mandates to be an unfunded state mandate. So I expect that we'll be fully funded for the special state primary. And if we hold the uh, state election on the state town election on the same day, there will be some costs. I mean, there'll be. Uh, there are some requirements that we have to have, like two different voting lists, uh, two different sets of paperwork, uh, more more people there, ultimately more training. Uh, but essentially, the big ticket items like personnel uh, and uh, primarily personnel, uh, we could probably save as much as forty-five thousand dollars. But you only have to do one setup and all of those kinds of things. One setup, one election machine, but two right. sets of ballots, right? Um, and uh, two sets of books, because those who, are, who may be qualified to vote in the town election may not be quali qualified to vote in the state primary, so we have to keep two ah, separate books. I see. Okay. So does that mean, you know, the machine where you put your ballot into and it gets counted, are you going to need to have double? No, no you would put, uh, presumably if you chose to, and it's your choice, it's not required, but if you chose to both take a, a town election ballot and a state primary ballot, you mark those, you check out at both, at both checklists, uh, you would insert both ballots into the machine, and they would be counted separately at the end of the evening as a state primary election and as a town election. The machine is able to recognize and distinguish between the two. Okay. Good. Selectman Goldstein? Thanks. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Town Clerk Ward for, for checking into this. Uh, even before the, uh, the uh, state primary election was set, uh, Patrick uh, already got to work on, on investigating this on the possibility that it would, would happen and uh, and he and I spoke he had some reservations That's our Patrick uh, <laughs> yes yes uh, not, not the governor Patrick but the clerk Patrick um, there there are definitely some logistical challenges about conducting the, the, the two elections on one day and he, uh, Patrick went to his uh, his town clerk gurus and, and uh, 
they'll tell you that there's one one town clerk who who is dead set against the idea, and another town clerk who's who's uh, thinks it's the only way to go. Um, so this is not without uh, considerable extra work for and, and challenge and. Uh, and uh, you know the logistics of it uh, are important to get right because if it if it if it doesn't go right, it can, yeah. Let me let me just say this: is that uh, it's been done before. Uh, it can be done. It's 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 just it's not particularly easy, but it can be done. Uh, most clerks would rather not do it. I know that historically, except for this circumstance, the Secretary of State's office recommends against it, uh, only because there could be confusion on the part of the election workers. Uh, but generally speaking, if we properly train our workers uh, and, we, uh, and we properly set up things, uh, uh, it should go relatively smoothly. So. Sackman Baker? Right. With, with this vote today, assuming, and, and I assume we will vote to move the election, will nomination papers for town offices be available tomorrow? I've got everything <laughs> ready, set to go for tomorrow if you vote okay. today for April 30th. So uh, people, people, candidates for town meeting, for selectmen, for town offices, uh, will be able to pick papers up tomorrow. Papers will be available tomorrow along with the book that where we record uh, papers being taken out. All correspondence to town meeting members via incumbency are scheduled to go out in the mail tomorrow, uh, as well as the incumbents uh, town wides. Um, and the uh, calendar will be posted on the website this evening if you voted tonight. Great. Good. Very good. Can I have one, one follow sure. up on that? Is there, is there a, a uh, bylaw that requires a certain amount of time between the day when the papers are available to be pulled and the election? And are we, are we uh, in, in any way uh, you know, violating that, that, that bylaw? No, there's case? nothing in the general laws or the bylaws that link the distribution of the nomination papers to any any particular election date. Uh, those those date the, the dates that are really of concern are by in the general laws and their filing deadlines, not not availability deadlines. Good. And how, how long will people have? Assuming they pulled their papers tomorrow. Uh, when, when, when is if the they if they pulled their papers tomorrow, you would have until March 12th for the annual town election to file with the, with the board of registrars for certification. Good. And this, there's actually been some uh, correspondence on the town meeting members association website about this. This does not change the date of town meeting, Correct. nor does this yeah. change the date for individuals to get warrant articles filed for town meeting, which right. remains March 14th at noon. Correct. There is no link. Right. So this is just for the papers for the election. Right. Uh, okay. Any other questions before we undertake the votes? All right, then first, I move that we reconsider the board vote of January 15th, 2013, setting the annual town election f date for Tuesday, May 7th, 2013. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, and then I move that we rescind the vote of January 15th, setting the annual town election for Tuesday, May 7th, 2013. All in favor of rescinding, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Banker. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. And finally, I move that we set Tuesday, April 30th, 2013, as the date for the annual town election. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Banker. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. All right. Thank you Mr. Very much. Ward, you have your marching orders. Thank you. Pat. And your calendar. <laughs> Next item is consideration of a resolution having to do with Norfolk County. And I think we have a, uh, an updated, yes, we got an updated version of the language. Um, Selectman Goldstein, this is your area. Yep. Um, do you have some comments or um, Thoughts about this well, without, going forward? Uh, without restating the, the whole mm -hmm. case, uh, I think I've mentioned before that I'm, I, um, I, I support this resolution. I think it uh, drives home the point that we've been trying to make about, about the county. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, and, and also support the revisions that have been pr proposed by Mr. Kleckner, uh, which, uh, you know, aside from a few um, corrections of, of typos and uh, 
you know, uh, correcting some some uh, some finer points in the in the whereas clauses. Uh, I think the the pertinent point is that it. Um, we express our, our commitment to pursue the withdrawal from Norfolk County government and or to support other mechanisms to eliminate the inequitable county assessment. And I think that's a, a very salient point. I think there are uh, other me measures that will eliminate the inequity without, you know, necessarily requiring us to, to withdraw. And I think the, uh, the, 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 the parties who brought this to our attention uh, are in agreement that, uh, that those measures would be um, all, as satisfactory, reasonable, as, as satisfactory right. as withdrawal. So. Okay. Um, other comments, members of the board? No, no I'm Shall happy we? with uh, <coughs> Mr. Kleckner's revisions, but okay. I think we should move ahead. Um, well, I think because this um, is of some significance, I'm going to read it all out. Um, the resolution that we are proposing to adopt. Uh, states as follows. Whereas in 1997 and 1998, the General Court of the Commonwealth dissolved most county governments within Massachusetts, including Berkshire, Essex, Franklin, Hampton, Hampshire, Middlesex, Suffolk, and Worcester. And whereas two of the dissolved counties became part of a regional council government, while six counties remained in operation, including Barnstable, Bristol, Norfolk, Plymouth, Nantucket, and Dukes. And whereas most of the functions, services, and duties of the dissolved county governments were transferred to state government jurisdiction, including the recording of property transactions within the registries of deeds and the management of correctional facilities by the offices of sheriff and Whereas the Commonwealth also took on responsibility for funding the continuing liabilities associated with those dissolved county governments, such as pensions and other post-employee, sorry, employment benefits, while the counties that were not dissolved remain burdened with these obligations. And whereas 70% of the population of Massachusetts now resides within jurisdictions not covered by county government, and whereas it is unfair and inequitable that municipalities where county government has been dissolved receive essentially the same services as municipalities within existing counties, but are not required to pay an assessment for these services or the liabilities accumulated from prior county government operations, and whereas the town of Brookline is paying a mandatory assessment to fund Norfolk County government in the amount of $715,791 in fiscal year 2013, and whereas county assessments are based on a municipality's property value rather than the benefits the municipality may receive based on population, proximity to county facilities, etc. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Brookline hereby commits to pursue its withdrawal from Norfolk County government and or to support mechanisms to eliminate the inequitable county assessment. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. So, and can I ask now, Mr. Kleckner, are you yeah. then going to send this yes. around to the other um, cities and towns within Norfolk County or yes. to so ask the, if they want to? Yes, so the idea is that there was a, a fact sheet that uh, accompanies the resolution. I need to edit that a little bit more, but that's, I will send that to each chief executive officer, which could be the selectmen in, in towns, uh, a mayor in a city, in some cases the town manager, and ask them, uh, tell them that we've adopted this resolution and, and seek their support of adopting a similar resolution. So, and then, and I assume we will also send this um, to our state our legislators, legislators. Right, uh, I, the county and other interested parties. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should talk to them on February 11th when we're all <laughs> assigned to other places to be. <laughs> the legislative roundtable that's on oh, um, right. the same night as yes. many other obligations. I can tell you, I've, I have completed my uh, my sit down with each of member ah, of our legislative good for delegation, you. Le, le, delegation at this yeah. point, and uh, 
and I think we have the support of all, all five, including Senator Oh, Green. good. That's very nice to hear. Good for you, and thank well, you for doing that. I'm going to try to make it to the legislative roundtable, if I can, after the other meeting. Well, the, meeting, the, the possibility is, yeah, right, and, and we might either, um, one of us possibly, we'll see. It depends on how things go. It's the one night where there are so many things scheduled that it's complicated. Okay, the next item on the calendar is a discussion um, with regard to a charge, possibly a potential charge, to the Committee on Town Organization and Structure. Um, I think before we start our conversation, I'd, I'd like to just very briefly um, go over some of the history. Sure. Before we take up the charge, because I do believe this is important um, for, for folks to somehow have a context for this conversation. Um, and now I'm trying to find my carefully put together. All right. Um, I sort of did a little outline because I was confused. Part of the, um, well, what is driving this is that we have two bylaws and two appointed entities whose responsibilities seem to overlap. And these are uh, overlaps that seem to have occurred over history. I think they're probably not intended, but they certainly have uh, recently become um, sufficiently confusing that we were working to try to clarify um, the roles and responsibilities. Uh, the two entities are the um, Human Relations Youth Resources Commission and our Human Resources Board and their two departments. And they seem to be charged with um, overlapping responsibilities. But I want to just walk quickly through some history. Um, the Human Relations Commission bylaw was adopted in 1970, but it was um, actually in response to um, some very significant historic events in the 60s. Um, we passed civil rights legislation, um, and there was a Kerner Commission report that talked about why um, minorities were angry and rioting and there was a lot of disruption going on. And I can tell you that I was at the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968 and got gassed, so I know what it was like. Um, having said that, there was a very strong and passionate discussion about civil rights. And in Brookline, there was a committee called the Committee on Urban Responsibility who actually met over almost 18 months, apparently. Um, the documentation is quite extraordinary, and it's beautifully written, I will have to say, um, but very long, like 80 pages. Um, there were 130 citizen members who met um, over 18 months, and they were making recommendations in response to the conditions at the time and particularly to the Kerner Report on Civil Unrest. And they divided into subcommittees. They looked at jobs, they looked at housing, they looked at community relations, they looked at education, and they looked at finance, which I thought was confusing at first, but what I really think they were talking about was uh, bank lending practices, uh, which is to say redlining. Um, anyway, out of, this recommendation, out of this report, two bylaws were passed. One established the Human Relations Commission with 12 members and uh, had some general duties, which I'm just going to refer, I've, I've sort of extracted here, but in general, this is what they were, this is a quotation. With developing opportunities within Brookline and the metropolitan area for those who are discriminated against, to increase communication across racial lines, to destroy stereotypes, to halt polarization, to end distrust and hostility, and to create common ground for efforts toward public order and social justice, and to increase the capacity of public and private institutions to respond to the problems of the disadvantaged. And then there were some other um, uh, tasks that were assigned to the commission. Um, 
to adopt affirmative action guidelines, to administer affirmative action programs relating to contracts, to investigate complaints charting discrimination or unlawful conduct, to institute and assist development of educational programs, and to promote equal rights and opportunities. There was a second bylaw which charged with the Human Relations Commission with oversight on compliance with non-discrimination laws with regard to the awarding of contracts, both from the uh, awarding side and also to oversee that the bidders be in compliance with non-discrimination laws. Um, the commission drafted affirmative action um, guidelines and they were modified over time. Uh, the first were adopted in 1973 with um, uh, modifications and amendments in 1976, 1977, 1979. In 1988, the town enacted a fair housing bylaw, which also uh, gave uh, uh, oversight to the Human Relations Commission as the local enforcement agency, basically uh, kind of, um, as I understand it, uh, enacting what the state um, Massachusetts Commission against discrimination, uh, implementing the same kinds of regulations and compliance issues that the MCAD does at the state level. Um, somewhere along the way, and I, I don't have the answer to this, um, youth resources was added to the responsibilities for the commission. And I, um, I, I note that in the original Committee on Urban Responsibility report, there was actually a recommendation that the town establish child care centers because that would widen employment opportunities. So there's a connection there, and I'm sure there were other connections with youth later. Um, but that came through as an amendment to the human relations bylaw. Um, the selectmen adopted and updated policies against sexual harassment in the 1990s. And in 1994, the la was the last time our Affirmative Action Equal Opportunity Plan was adopted. Um, in the meantime, in the year 2000, uh, re in response to um, a coincidence that the, at that time, chair and director of the then personnel department and personnel board both retired, uh, the town invited the Mass Municipal Association to review our personnel department and to recommend um, improvements and um, updating our practices. And what came out of that was a, a set of recommendations, in particular, um, to end the practice of having volunteers. The, uh, the then chair of the personnel board uh, was actively engaged in negotiating collective bargaining agreements, and the, the bylaw was intended to end that practice. Um, in 2000, therefore, a bylaw was adopted establishing a human resources department to replace personnel and assigning to the HR board the responsibility of dealing with a spectrum of employee issues, including recruitment, hiring, development, training, retention, protection against discrimination and harassment and grievance procedures. Currently, collective bargaining is conducted by our HR director and uh, in association with Labor Council. Board members must have qualifications such as employment administration experience, labor or employment law experience, human resources or labor law academicians, or business executive experience. Um, a sort of one other <coughs> item that affects this is that in 2009, town meeting approved that the non-public safety employees of the town no longer participate in the state civil service, uh, in state civil service, which opened the pool of candidates to be hired, although our public safety employees continue to be covered by civil service. Um, anyway, the um, human relations and human resources activities clearly have a certain um, amount of overlap now. And it seems appropriate for us to try to help clarify. And I hope, um, I, I have to say, I was quite inspired by reading the core report, um, perhaps even give the um, Human Relations Commission 
um, more strength with regard to some of the uh, other tasks that were assigned to them, uh, for example, fair housing, around which I think there is nothing much being done today. Anyway, that's sort of a historic synopsis, which gets us to Selectman Daly's yes. proposal. Well, I, I, and we had heard from Rita McNally, who's here tonight and is uh, currently serving as chair of the um, Human Relations Commission. Uh, I won't. I won't say youth resources every time, but you can uh, assume assume that I've that I've said it. Um, so that they are they are would would like some clarification as to exactly what their role should be, and um, it and it is clear as you just explained that you know over time the the uh, the two the two the human relations commission and the human resources board have sort of overstepped each other um, to some extent and it, it isn't clear who who is supposed to be doing what now so I did write a charge um, the the charge is a couple paragraphs and then there's uh, some some background material that um, uh, I added on and I did uh, Patty Korea assistant town council did uh, extensively edit uh, my background <laughs> facts that I wrote so um, but I, I, I hope I hope we got it uh, got them accurately um, so and I know um, chairman DeWitt you I initially wrote this as a charge to um, the committee on town organization and structures um, but I, I you have had some conversation with them and I, I'd like you to tell everybody what the the uh, gist of your conversation was so they're probably not the appropriate place well, for this to go. Now. I did talk to the chair of the Committee on Town Organization and Structure, who said that she felt um, that while they would be more than willing and interested in taking this up, they her her suggestion was that we might be better served with a an independent committee. Um, and give it time and uh, the ability to um, really review the existing bylaws, to look at best practices um, wherever they are, both re uh, with regard to employment, but also um, the other uh, concepts that are embodied in the original core report, uh, which had to do with um, um, making us a welcoming community, uh, they certainly talked about the fact that at that time it was clear and documented that um, people who wanted to live here found barriers to um, being able to purchase a home or rent. Uh, I don't believe that's true today, but I don't know anymore. And I guess one of the things that we um, have neglected is, is the, um, um, the broader um, responsibilities that were originally being considered at the time that recommendation was made. So um, I, I, my guess is just in the dynamics of things, um, what the chair of the Committee on Town Organ Organization and Structures suggested was that they would welcome recommendations for bylaw amendments or revisions and then they would comment on that, but she wasn't sure that it was appropriate for them to undertake a broader review and that's uh -huh. that was really her response okay and I, I should say that I and I tried to make this clear in in the charge that I wrote um, that it the the area of overlap is to do with town employment issues in particular and there yes. are other issues that are have been historically assigned to, to um, human relations um, that the human resources board has nothing to do with and and would not you know, get involved right. in. Um, so um, the, the probably my thought now is that given the the discussion you had with um, the chairman of the CTO and S is that a, a selectman's committee would be the appropriate place to get going on taking a look at this. And um, that's what I would suggest, but I'm certainly interested to hear what Ms. McNally and others have to say about it. Or you want to, let's, let's uh, well, let's first say, do members of the board have questions at this point in time? Not yet. No? no. Okay. Um, then, Ms. McNally, if you'd like to come up to the podium. 
and I, I should explain, you are the chair of the temporary, temporary, chair. temporary chair of the Human Relations Youth Resources right. Commission. Uh, and we're going to be speaking about to the ways to increase workplace diversity, right? That's what's on the table, as well as some of the other conflict uh, and duplication. And the Human Relations uh, Commission, we were there doing these things, and then the Human Resources took over some of of the duties because of new bylaws. So, um, and I want to say something that I hope I don't forget, and that is, I don't agree with you, Madam Chair, that this should be a selectman committee. Well, I thought that an was independent committee. I, that independent. Was my, my It'd be better for the community if it's a moderator's committee and that we call on uh, both educational institutions and others so that it's not a suspect or tainted group so that we can take it out of that suspicion area. Uh, and uh, Well, that it's a, a selectman's committee. We can appoint. Well, the it's moderator can appoint, too. It's not going to be just the selectman on the selectman's committee. No, I understand that. I understand that, you know. Yeah. But it might get us moving faster if it's a moderator's committee. It might not. I mean, you can leave it up to town meeting if you wish. Uh, and one other thing that I wanted to say up front is that our commission, the makeup of the Human Relations Commission should really reflect the composition of the community. And we have data from the uh, census that tells us that we have a growing Asian population, Hispanic population, and uh, I think the uh, African American population has remained constant. So I would like in the future time to see that people that are appointed um, in consultation with the uh, director and or commission chair, uh, but there should be some kind of a collaboration so we can tell what the skills are that we need on the commission and what the goals are so people kind of know ahead of time and that we have a real uh, variety. Uh, I found in uh, the charge and I don't know if you're also going to do the charge of whatever commission yeah, is put up, be, that we need to state fine. up front our community's commitment to affirmative action slash diversity slash equal opportunities. I'd put all three of them in there so that it's open, that we still have that commitment and we're trying to find a way to fulfill that. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, the over, oversight uh, duties of the commission, we've had difficulty fulfilling that uh, because there isn't data. We need to get the data format set up so that we can find out if the, uh, the pool for the uh, hiring is diversified and how is it done and whether the kind of advertisements that we're sending out uh, to attract people to job offers are really in keeping with the time of life that this is, 2013. You know, the whole social information swing of things. I mean, and we can't really sit back and wait for people to come to us. I mean, that's apparent. We have to go out and seek people, meaning we have to go into other communities, other professional organizations, and really do outreach. And it may mean that we do job fairs or go to other people's uh, communities' job fairs and really build collaboration so that we really can attract people that will you know, bring new ideas and new ways of coping with some of these uh, issues. Uh, our goals were civil rights, youth advocacy, and intergroup relations, and we hope that we can have both the staff and the talent on the board to help do these things and uh, the money that's needed in these very poor times uh, to do that. And that's what I think ours. I had uh, some criticism of some, not criticism, but I just wanted to add other information to this charge. And if it's not going to CTOS, whatever charge goes to whatever commission that's set up or a uh, committee, uh, I think really we have to look at the language. The language is so confusing, and I'm sure that when you try to read through, you might have seen that. Um, terminology is used interchangeably, a uh, human relations, capital H, capital R, human services, capital H, capital S, 
human resources, small h, small r, so I don't know if that's referring to the human resource board or that's another way of talking about human services and I was wondering if we were supposed to be giving CPR or inoculations to people throughout the town. The, just the way of reading it. Times have changed. We need to really seriously look at it. And one of our commission members has provided us with enormous amounts of reading. Uh, and anyway, we need to look at that. Uh, and as I said, a moderator's blue ribbon committee is better. And I believe Northeastern University and its Dukakis Center would be a good start. Um, and I also mentioned something about Harvard that I'm not going to say. All right, and if we have to look broader for minority citizens to get involved, then that's what we have to do. We have to look at other organizations, maybe outside of Brookline, where some of the minority uh, members would be willing to come and help us set up whatever uh, situations that we need to have. And I think that's mainly but the confusion is there, and I think there has to be collaboration between both of these departments, and we don't often see that, and I think that it's something that we need to do. We're not in competition, really, with each other. We're trying to find our way, and we're trying to do our duty of oversight, and if we're blocked, then that's not going to happen, and then there are repercussions from the community about that, because in 40 years, you know, we don't have... Uh, many representations of other cultures on our various committees and certainly not on the commission and uh, not in the workforce as well. So we're ho hoping that we can all work together and I think that it's a possibility uh, to do. We just have to put our heads together and move on. Thanks. Thank you. Just one, sure. one quick question. Wait, uh, don't go. Just like when Benka. Oh. If you... Um, made clear your preference for a moderators committee as opposed to a selectmen's committee. How would you feel about CTONS? I felt going through this, and I read a document that I was given today about a report from the CTOS of 1983, and then I read a report from the CTOS committee that was working on revising and changing some things, and it made me change. I don't think the CTOS is at this point the group to study this. I would really like to see people on the outside who have been dealing with the uh, affirmative action in many, many towns and cities, and there, there's a different view of it than maybe people that have been staying in town and trying to deal with other kinds of issues. I'd like not to see this as a complete a uh, reorganization plan only. I mean, we're dealing with things that are important, like we'd like to oversee what uh, the departments are doing and that not going to them, but relying on the human relations or re human resources department to gather the data. And if we're not gathering data, then how do we know what's happening, you know? And if that's our uh, responsibility, then that's what we want to do. And we need cooperation in order to do that. But the CTOS, I, I didn't think that this particular topic, because of what I read in those documents, the confusion over terminology, the confusion over what happened, the lack of uh, time to gather resources, the lack of uh, skills to know where to look for resources or data or uh, information or what's going on in other communities in this particular thing. It would take a really long time commitment, I think, for CTOS, although some of the members of the present CTOS board may have uh, been involved from early on and have an awareness of it. Okay. Thanks. Quick question. Simon uh, Goldstein. Uh, Rita, thanks for your, your comments. Very, very useful. Um, given, though, that uh, town meeting isn't until May, and, and I, I'm aware that there, is, there, there may very well be a warrant article that... Or two or three. Or two or three. Um, it just it seems to me we're going to lose, you know, four or five months until town meeting. Is that a reason to make this a selectman's committee and maybe have it endorsed by town meeting? Or You or see what a rush that? has done if you read the 1983 CTOS report without any kind of supporting data or research. It's just going to be what someone 
thinks should happen or thinks did happen. It's a lot of material to go through. And I've found that the uh, moderators' committees that are put together have less suspect. And I don't mean that you're all suspicious characters. But in this instance, when there's a something happening that impacts affirmative action uh, and the view of the outside world and for people that are impacted by it, I think it's better that you get a more independent group of skilled people. And I think the Dukakis Center at Northeastern has experience in doing these kinds of things. And we're not the only community that's going through a reevaluation of what took place years ago and what what's, has to be done now to make things work the way they should so that we're getting some success rather than, um, well, duplication and stress and then reorganization. Uh, I would hope this wouldn't just be a reorganization task and that we really try to get to solving some of the problems that are being voiced. But I, I, it, you'll do what you feel the need to do, but that's my opinion. I'm not sure the moderator will be happy to hear my opinion, but... <laughs> may not be. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. Well, actually, if you want to know, I posed the question to the moderator, <laughs> and he said yes. he thought the two commissions should sit down and sort things out first. That was his suggestion, so he may have changed his mind about that. I, I just want to respond to that a little bit. Um, uh, the reason I think a selectman's committee is better because we have the, uh, I mean, we can set up a very diverse committee and we have some resources that we could reach out and perhaps, uh, I, I, I don't want to make Mr. Kleckner fall off his chair there, but we <laughs> might have some resources to spend some money to consult with the Dukakis Center or something like that. Uh, we might, we can call upon ta staff to, um, help us work through things, whereas a moderator's committee d does not have the same resources. So that was one of my thoughts, that it, this is a very complicated issue and that um, we would be able to bring a few more, uh, quite, a, quite a few more resources to bear on the problem. As long as it increases workplace diversity and that we have that commitment in town, I think, you know, whatever you decide to do, just my preference would be the other, but you know, it's up to you what you feel. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, you do have a couple of your commissioners here. Anybody else want to add to this before we move on? We don't probably, I don't think we're going to take action tonight, so there's no urgency. Sure. Um, my name's Brian Hochleitner. I'm, I'm the newest We're going to learn how to pronounce your name. Just say it the, again. <laughs> I'm the newest member of the commission. I, I um, have just sort of joined in the last few weeks, and I was here a month ago or so. Um, and so I feel like I've, I've got a unique perspective on some of this stuff. I don't, I don't profess to know as much about the history as other people, and um, I know there's been a lot of discussions about sort of what we can do better here in the town to in increase diversity. I guess what I would just say is I, I think I, what I would add is that I've been reading a lot of stuff recently, talking to different people that are involved, um, trying to, to understand the issues and, and the history, and um, I think sort of two things that I've taken away. One is that there really is a confusion in terms of the bylaws and how they work. And it seems like people just haven't focused on it. And I, and I, and I, and I think there's different reasons for that, but, but I do think it's good to take it up and for, for there to be some group, and I'm, I think I'm sort of agnostic about what the right group is. I think it should be a diverse group, but I think it should be a group that takes up this question. Um, the second thing I think I would say that I've, taken away in just the last few weeks of, of joining the commission and, and attending some of their meetings and, and hearing about this is that there really is a group of articulate, thoughtful, um, intelligent people on the commission that are interested in, in 
you know, moving this issue forward and 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 sort of and and making progress on it. And I think um, you know, it's just good to figure out how we can capitalize on that and and sort of put those efforts, you know, into a, a more productive mode. Which takes me to kind of the bylaws and and I guess and the charge. And I think I have two comments on that. One is just that. You know, if you read the bylaws, one thing that they seem to contemplate is that there's there's a, a department of human relations, youth resources, and I think that the reality is that there's been sort of one person who's been um, the director, and that person is retiring in the next couple of months, and so it, it presents an opportunity to sort of look at what the right um, organizational structure is in terms of the commission's relationship to the town and sort of how that should work. And I think that should be part of what is looked at as, as, as through this effort. And then I think the second thing, and this takes me back to why, I, in some ways, why maybe this hasn't been looked at, is there's just this natural confusion about the names of these two bodies. I would there's go back to personnel and I'm resources Blink. and human relations and, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how many times I've even people that are on the commission when they're talking about it will get the names backwards and and I really think that at the end of the day it just comes down to human relations youth resources is a confusing name and people don't really know what exactly it is what it what it does what it is and so I would say I think names are important I think that one thing that could be looked at as part of this is figuring out is that the right name for this body? Should it be, I mean, is it really a civil rights commission, a diversity commission, um, equal opportunity? What, are the, what, is, what is the charge of that commission? Human relations is very broad and youth resources is kind of off in a different direction. So I think that, um, not to you know, put too much emphasis on just the words, but I do think they're important and I think it should be part of um, a part of this um, what this committee or, or group ends up looking at when they're thinking about these things. Well, I, uh, I will tell you that I get tongue-tied every time I try to say these things, and I, I think I do understand we change personnel to human resources because at the time, and maybe it still is, that was a broader uh, definition of, um, I'm going to say, uh, because it, is, it has now um, more responsibilities that are broader than just hiring. And so human resources, I mean, I think you look around in um, um, academia, you know, you're going to find a human resources department, right. among other things. Uh, but I would immediately go back to personnel <laughs> if we were allowed to do that. Or maybe a better name, whatever it is. But I, I think you're right. And it is true, it adds in a kind of crazy way to the confusion. So yeah. thinking of good names and clear and, and names. I, and I think that you know, to the extent our goal is to attract more diverse members to the commission, um, you know, if it was called the Civil Rights Commission or mm -hmm. something, that might mm -hmm. attract yeah. some different people who um, wouldn't necessarily <laughs> want to be a member of a commission if they were having a little more trouble figuring out exactly what it was that they were doing there. Uh, I would certainly think whatever else the group does, whoever appoints it, that should be part of an explicit um, recommendation, is that they think of names that are both clear but also not confusing. Distinct. And distinct, right. I think, but that's, in a way, that's symbolic of the task, which is to untangle uh, the areas where there are overlaps and the areas where there is lack of clear um, mission, in my view. Um, I know that a couple of years ago, the then chair of the commission um, had an idea about uh, something he wanted to do, and he called it listening to the community. Um, and the idea was to basically invite people to uh, talk to the commission about, and here you can fill in the blanks, so to speak, their experience um, uh, finding housing or um, in other ways 
um, whether they were candidates for employment or um, work for the town, but just you know reach out to different communities and use that as a way of helping the commission sort of get a focus. Uh, never happened, and I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but I do think community outreach, and interestingly, that was part of what was originally um, asked. I mean, when, when the 1970 bylaw was passed, it seems that the, um, there was an enormous burden <laughs> placed on this group of volunteers just in terms of the breadth of uh, tasks that they were being assigned. So somehow we have to find a way to make it both manageable and effective, and I think that's very important. So thank you very much. Anybody else want to speak? Sure. Let, let's, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brooks Ames. I am the chairman of the diversity subcommittee of the Human Relations Commission. Um, I, I don't really speak for anyone but myself here tonight, and I think Rita would probably acknowledge that that's the case for her as well. We have not, um, as a group, taken up your charge and, and, and looked at it carefully or, and come to a collective decision. Uh, my impression, however, is that the commission is not uh, of one mind um, in terms of what the way forward is here. Um, one thing that is not addressed in the charge is that there are two policy differences that I think have been presented um, in the plan that was put forth by our commission or recommended to the selectmen by our commission was a equal opportunity and affirmative action plan. A, another plan or policy was put forth by the Human Relations, yep. sorry, Human Resources <laughs> Board, and that is an equal opportunity plan. And I, I do think the words matter. Uh, when we put together uh, our equal opportunity and affirmative action plan, we drew uh, heavily from Governor Patrick's executive order on affirmative action. And uh, our plan does contemplate some form of affirmative action. There is uh, an enormous uh, amount, I think, of, of uh, th there's a lot of space between a strict equal opportunity plan and a aggressive affirmative action plan. And it's not clear to me from where I sit that the selectmen as policymakers for the town have uh, come to ground on, on, on where we are. Uh, my sense in the back and forth that's gone on in the last few months is that there is a strong view in the town council's uh, office that we can't even say the word affirmative action. And I think that the policy choices have been too constrained by the legal advice. And when you have, when we have Governor Patrick, who after all was the architect of, or he, he may not say he was the architect, but he was part of the team behind President Clinton's uh, end it don't mend, uh, mend it, don't end it approach to affirmative action back in the mid-90s. When you have Governor Patrick putting out an executive order uh, of affirmative action, when you have the state agencies having affirmative action plans, I think it's, it's too constrained to narrow the debate, uh, to narrow the policy choices to just equal opportunity. I think the town does need to consider and look at affirmative action. Um, and it's not clear to me that this charge really takes any of that on. It's The charge is really about the organizational chart, and it doesn't get to that, that more fundamental policy question. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a real issue that the town needs to grapple with. Uh, we had the selectmen adopted an affirmative action plan in 1994 and in 2000 or 2001, 
it simply fell off the map. And I think that there should be a bit of an accounting for why that came to be. There was no Supreme Court case that came out in 2000 or 2001 that changed the landscape suddenly. That's just not the case. That's, that's not what happened. So I think the town does need to understand what happened uh, with affirmative action in the town and what the selectman's position is on affirmative action. Okay, questions? Well, we've got Mr. Ames before us. I, I'm gonna respond by saying that I would not expect that we would limit this uh, study in any way. So I think maybe your concerns are, um, what I would hope personally is that we would in fact have a thorough, and here you can fill in the blanks, uh, investigation, study, review of what the current best practices are, which could absolutely include whatever the state's doing. But it does not mean that we would be limited to discussion only of do we do affirmative action or do we do equal opportunity. It would be what is the best way to go forward as opposed to a debate over language. And I think we would all agree that our goal is to have an inclusive community, to have a diverse community, and to have a diverse workforce. My point was only that the charge, which came out on Friday, didn't address that. I, and I think what we've already agreed to here is that the charge is too narrow, and we're not gonna adopt this charge. It was a sort of first take. Um, but it by no means represents uh, that we've agreed to go ahead with it. Does that help at all? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it does. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, part of my hesitation is that I was here, I think, in 2011 when the first diversity report came out, and you indicated at that time that you were going to form a selectments committee, which was going to be uh, headed up by Selectman Rommel to evaluate um, and look at the existing plan and what might be done to change it. Um, that never got off the ground. Um, what, what we have now is a, a, an issue where two policies are in front of the Selectman and the Selectman can take those up and give some direction. Um, and I'm not sure that kicking the can down the road with a commission or a committee is really um, the right move. I think it's time to sort of tee this up for town meeting. And th again, this is, this is my personal view. I'm not speaking for the commission. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, but I think that there are others in town who think that town meeting is the right forum to get some of these issues on the table. Um, there was no debate, there was no public comment when the affirmative action plan that the selectmen adopted in 1994 was discontinued. And it seems to me that when the town, uh, town meeting legislates, essentially legislates affirmative action back in 1970 or whenever it was, that if, if we're going to discontinue it, it should happen right out in the open and it should be public, and town meeting should weigh in. That's, that's my personal Ultimately, view. that has to happen. I, I don't think you've understood. What, what we've been discussing here is how you get all of the information you need in order to make a good decision, not whether it should ever go to town meeting. There's no way we could change anything without having it go before town meeting. It has to go before town meeting. It's a more a matter of in what form and when. It's not a matter of does town meeting, it has to be discussed if we are going to make any kind of substantial revisions. I, 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 I agree with you entirely and I think it may just be a different difference of opinion as to what the best way to get it in front of town meeting is, whether it's a commission, and my, my sense is that it's hard to find a commission that's really going to be disinterested and so, in, in, in many, many times, uh, it seems to me the best way to uh, air out an issue is to have people who have different views um, express them. 
as best they can, and then people will make up their minds. I think we would agree on that one. The question is how much information they have before they express their opinions. Uh, Selectman Goldstein? Right, I want to pick up on that, <clears throat> Chairman DeWitt. So, uh, Mr. Ames, my understanding is that since the, the time that the town adopted an affirmative action policy, that there have been some, some court-ordered interpretations and some co constitutional decisions made. And forgive me because it's not my field, but I, I, I mean, I couldn't begin to to tell you what the current standards are and what the what the the, the judicial mandates on, on the subject are. Uh, my understanding is that it's a very complicated subject, and I question whether the floor of town meeting is the place for 350 people who have to make an intelligent decision on that to you know, and hear an hour's worth of debate, whether that's the, the, the correct way to, to resolve that, that argument. It seems to me a, a perfect case for, for, for when you need some, uh, uh, an organization of, of, of disinterested uh, and, and unbiased people to carefully examine it and lay out the, the, the parameters, lay out the, 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 the points and counterpoints of the argument so that a more careful consideration could be made than, than is possible on the, on the floor of town meeting. Well, I, I, I'm not sure you're giving town meeting enough, enough credit. There's, there's a, a lot of process that goes, um, <coughs> that, there, there's, a, there's a lot that goes on between when an article is uh, presented and when it's actually heard by town meeting. It goes in front of this, your body, goes in front of the selectmen. Mm -hmm. There's a public hearing. There's a hearing in front of a subcommittee of the advisory committee. There's a hearing before the full advisory committee. There's groups in town that have hearings. So there are certainly opportunities for people to get information and for uh, views to be expressed and, 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 and heard. I, respectfully, you know, I think that there's uh, a, a limited number of people who involve themselves, town meeting members who involve themselves in that process, and uh, and there are a subset of town meeting who, who do not generally involve themselves in, in the, the ongoing process leading up to town meeting, and I think those are the people for whom you know, some kind of a considered report is, is, most, is most useful beyond what you'd usually see in the selectmen's and in the advisory committee's report. I, I don't want to interrupt, but I will say that I was totally inspired by the Committee on Urban Responsibilities report in terms of the thought that went into it and the level of detail. Now, we're not going to put 130 people um, on the project now, I think. Uh, those were different times. But I do think, um, and I agree with you, there are thoughtful um, people who could be engaged in this. Um, but I will say that the same breadth and level of thought would, would in inform all of us as opposed to, and I'm not imagining it's exactly what would happen, but right now we could find ourselves very narrowly focused on sort of regulatory issues, whereas it seems to me it's very important to think about community values and how we do the best we can to implement those values, and they certainly include diversity. Um, you know, it's interesting that the um, core report talked about uh, METCO. METCO is at risk right now, and METCO is important to this community, but nobody talks about it except by way of whether or not we can afford to have it anymore. And it seems to me that that's another um, sort of uh, example of something that could be, we could do a better job at being advocates uh, than we currently do. but. It's not part of just discussing workforce diversity. It's more than that. It's how we 
um, how we meet, we mentor, how we create the environment where everybody feels welcome and comfortable. And you can't do that by discussing whether it's equal opportunity or affirmative action. It's, it's got to have a broader, more thoughtful approach. That's my view. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, looking at METCO, but I, I, don't, I don't think that that's really the issue that's uh, in front of it's not part of the charge, certainly, and even if the charge were broader, I'm not, I'm not sure it would be. Uh, it, it's a, it, was a, it was a draft. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a draft, but I, a I, I think we're talking about two different things a little bit. I mean, right now we have, you are drawing up um, guidelines, and the Human Resources Board is drawing up another set of guidelines, and I, I think the question we're trying to get at is, whose responsibility is that? Um, and you're, you're asking us to say, um, You know, the, the, and, and in 2000, town meeting did um, give some significant responsibility uh, to the Human Resources Board, um, uh, and, and obviously, you know, they didn't really consider or think about, well, wait a minute, we're kind of maybe, are we taking this away from human relations or, or what? Um, and so you want us to jump to the issue of exactly what the policy should be when there's sort of a preliminary question, I think, about... Um, you know, wh whose responsibility is it, and who should, who should we on this board and, and others in town be listening to when we're getting competing um, reports from, from different groups? I, I think that's sort of what I was trying to get at with this charge. But uh, certainly the committee could, and we could, you know, could discuss your issue of exactly what uh, policy is, is the most appropriate in this day and age. And we could try to get, uh, you know, get some people on there who are uh, scholars in this area, or perhaps. Um, well, I, I'm I'm not advocating for a committee to study affirmative action. Um, my view is that it, it should be taken up as part of the political process, um, and that commissions aren't always the best way to take up a political issue. Okay, well, I just would respond to that, that I think that, that there are a lot of um, issues involved. We have um, collective bargaining agreements with our employees. And so, you know, that, that's pro I, I don't know if that's your legal area of expertise or not, but that we have to think about policies as they work within our collective bargaining, too, if you're talking about existing employees. Um, so there, there's also the, the sort of case law that has been changing and, you know, I'm on, on um, these, this sort of area. Unfortunately, I, I don't think any of us on here are, are particular fans of the current Supreme Court, but there have been a number of opinions that, um, you know, we have to also consider to what extent do we want to expose the town to liability. That's a concern for us because we're you know, the, the bottom line has to be something we worry about, the budget, too. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that play into this, and, um, you know, I think uh, we have to, we certainly have to be concerned with the bigger picture, and um, that's why I, I, I do think that it would be helpful to have somebody take a look at a, a number of aspects here and but as I say, this is still a draft, and it doesn't have to be exactly this way. But I do think that a committee uh, with some people with significant expertise in this area um, would be very helpful. Well, you do, you, do have, you do have a constitutional law expert, I would say, on your, on your board. Um, I'm sure he has a view. He, he, he will speak for himself. <laughs> Um, I well one one comment that I would like to make is that I think um, there are two issues and I think uh, uh, Brooks you uh, distinguish between them and I think Mr. Hochleiter did also um, there's the question of the policies guidelines whatever you want to call them uh, however you want to title them and there's also the question of the organizational structure and um, I, um, one thing that I would be very concerned about is the, um, not just the interaction between this and our union contracts, but also 
the interaction between this and the state open meeting law. And um, uh, th the um, requirements of the open meeting law, insofar as we're talking about issues like promotion or hiring um, or issues of that sort, um, an exception under the open meeting law is uh, you can go into executive session to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health rather than professional competence of an individual, or to discuss the discipline or dismissal over complaints or charges brought against a public employee. And the um, uh, commentary of the Attorney General on this is that the purpose is designed to protect the rights and reputations of individuals. Nevertheless, it appears that where a public body is discussing an employee evaluation, considering applicants for a position or discussing the qualifications of any individual, these discussions should be held in open session to the extent that the discussion deals with issues other than the ones of reputation and um, health and character and so forth. So I think, um, you know, we've, we've got to have a human resources department uh, where uh, questions of promotion and so forth are uh, decided and monitored um, rather than on the department level. I think that sort of issue can't be something that a public committee does, whether it's uh, the Human Resources Commission or the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission. Um, and uh, I think, we, you know, the, we, we have to be cognizant of the um, impacts of uh, what is being discussed on the town's employees and on their privacy. And uh, uh, to the extent that there are suggestions that some of these things like administering these policies should bubble up to a committee level, I think we have to be very careful about doing that. So, um, you know, I, it's, not, it's not an easy question. And, uh, but I, it, it is a question that goes well beyond, I think, um, the, the question of uh, uh, what is allowed under affirmative action. And, and it, is, uh, it is clear to me that there are some things that some affirmative steps that can still be taken under the, under the current uh, court. Um, but for our purposes as a municipality um, operating in Massachusetts under the state open meeting law and its requirements for things to be dis discussed in public, and as a um, community with uh, employees, uh, some represented by unions, some not represented by unions, but all interested in their privacy, I do think we have to be pretty careful about where we go. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farlow, you've got to come over there, otherwise you don't exist. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. You have to speak into the little black. Frank Farlow, Precinct 4. If the board does request an outside study from some group, do you anticipate at the moment, do you have any expectation at the moment of what you will include as a requested reporting date? Very good question and hard to answer right now, except that I would suggest based on what, I, I, I guess I'm going to reflect to you what Jean Berg said, <laughs> okay? Uh, she said if it were referred to her, she'd require a year, all right? And, and she has some experience doing things like this. So, um, and that's the only only benchmark I have at this moment. Um, I will I, say. I should think, though, that if we were paying somebody to do this, that it, it all depends on how it's done, right? Yeah. If it's um, could be less time. Is it could guess. be less time. Um, what I w would suggest is that the probability, just because it is very complicated, um, and I know just getting a group. Up to, up to speed and organized. I mean, there's a massive material here, as you well know. Um, I don't see how it could be done by the Maytown meeting. 
not done in a way that we would all find satisfactory anyway. Maybe the fall. Um, but that's my best answer. Okay. Any other questions, comments, members of the board? All right. Just to be clear, we had a draft um, that, that was brought before us in a way to stimulate this discussion. Um, we've certainly, uh, I think, among ourselves agreed that a referral at this time to CTONS is not appropriate. And so um, it will probably come back to the calendar um, in a different form um, over the next couple of weeks, maybe after we've had some time to think about it. So let me just say that sure. I will go back to the drawing board. So if anyone wants to contact me with specifics, uh, um, right. they, they feel free to do so. Can I, can I just? We, uh, we actually have a footnote here. Because next week I will be um, producing or presenting my budget, um, my fiscal year budget, and as was pointed out, uh, the director of the department has announced his resignation or his retirement uh, effective in April. So I will definitely, my budget will definitely be talking about the staffing and organization of the staff uh, component to the, to the to the commission and to the to the programming of human relations and, and human resources. And just to complicate things even further, there's a human services component uh, in the health department that I'm certainly <laughs> considering and thinking about how all these things relate to one another. So I don't want people to be surprised that I will be making some recommendations about um, the way in which um, the department and the, and the uh, programs are, are staffed and organized and certainly have no concern about the, those being reviewed in the context of any study the board uh, determines or, um, would be appropriate. Okay. Um, I think we conclude the Board of Selectmen's meeting for February 5th. Thank you all.